Good morning. How are you all? Good. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> I am blown away by what a beautiful city Saskatoon is. I got to walk a little bit this morning, and that river is something. Yes, I do have a view. You asked me, Jennifer. I have a view from my room. It's, I sent a picture to my partner of it this morning, and she was like, wow. Um, so thank you so much. Again, I'm looking forward to the next couple of days, and we're going to dive in. Um, what does, what, what does the demand of repentance and reparations mean for churches whose legacies of Christian practice are bound up in colonial settler and racist violence? What does the work of repentance mean in a world facing ongoing racial and nationalist turmoil? We could put it more simply than that in this way and just say, so, dear church, now what? So I was really honored when Lynn um, invited me a little over a year ago to come for this rejuvenation event. And I posed these questions to her at the time for a way to think about our work together because they seemed urgent to me then. But I will have to be a little bit honest. I was, um, yes, deeply honored to be invited, but I was also a little bit scared um, I've never spoken outside the U.S. before. This is the first time. Um, so thank you. <laughs> and so, but I knew even when the invitation came that I would thus be coming to a context where I'm really an outsider. Um, and that was a little bit daunting. It's still daunting. But it seemed to me nonetheless that these questions had the capacity to convene a cross-border theological and moral dialogue um, I knew, of course, that we would have to do some translation, and um, I knew we'd be encountering each other as people rooted in very different contexts, but I felt good about my yes. I would love to come. And that was then. <laughs> Friends, um, in the period of time since that initial yes, the consequences of the U.S.'s most recent presidential election have really begun to take hold. And so needless to say, my context has radically changed, not in a way discontinuous from the work I've been doing for a long time, um, but as in, as I was coming, I kept thinking, so you're having a conference on racial and indigenous justice. I'm really not sure a U.S. white settler colonial person is your go-to right now. I'm still so grateful to be here in ways that almost make me want to weep, given how hard it is in the United States right now, especially as an outsider to have been invited to cross your southern border. But like so many others in that little nation that sits just south of here, and especially given this week where the U.S. borders are making international news and violating all kinds of human rights, I'm really struggling with a deep disorientation. I'm really horrified at what my nation has unleashed, not just on most especially the marginalized both within and outside of U.S. borders, um, but truly, indeed, myself and so many others horrified at what we've unleashed on the world. And so to come here as someone representing that context, um, well, if I was daunted before, perhaps I might say I'm a little terrified. Still, if the questions that I had posed last year seemed urgent to me then, they now seem to me be, to be on fire. Because with each passing week in the last year, these questions have seemed to me to truly carry within them the very question of the future of the church, maybe even the question of the church's very existence. So I ask again, dear church, now what? So here's how I want to use my time this morning, my speaking part of our time. I'm going to begin by laying out an argument about the framework of reconciliation. And the way I'm going to do that is to share with you the ways in which the U.S. civil rights movement has been remembered in the white U.S. American church. I want to show how a deeply whitewashed history has kept the U.S. church 
and actually the United States as a whole, but I'm really thinking about the church today, how it's kept us trapped in the very same racial cul-de-sacs. Do you have cul-de-sacs in Canada? Okay. Uh, <laughs> the racial cul-de-sacs that we've actually been stuck in since the late 1960s. Counter to what we talk about when we say, oh, the civil rights movement, we had all this progress. No. We've been stuck in the exact same racial cul-de-sacs in the U.S. since the 1960s. And what I want to share is how a more truthful remembering of the U.S. civil rights movement and the church's role in that in the U.S. compels a theological shift from reconciliation as the call to repair or to reparations. And the way I'm largely going to do that is to tell that story through the context of white American and African American relations. So all of that's appropriate given my own expertise and experience and my identity as a scholar and as an activist and as a Christian. But I'm telling you that's my plan up front so that partway through you don't start going, oh my gosh, has she forgotten she's in Canada? <laughs> the U.S. Civil Rights Movement story isn't quite our story. And oh my gosh, does she remember we need largely here in this moment to be talking about indigenous and white colonial settler relationships? And I'm just telling you that now, no, I won't have forgotten. <laughs> so what I'm going to do with the second part of my time is to unpack some of the ways that a shift from reconciliation to repair pertains deeply to colonial settler relations and realities. And I'm going to argue that repair remains the appropriate framework for that at work as well. Um, now, in some ways, I want to say that for me to contextualize my arguments for you, first through a U.S. civil rights story about race, simultaneously works and totally doesn't work. <clears throat> it doesn't work because indigenous identities are not synonymous with racial identities. And it also doesn't work because the very notion of civil rights, which is how I enter this conversation initially, the very notion of civil rights assumes things about the legitimacy of nation states that already fail First Nations peoples. Okay, so it doesn't work. It does work because colonial settler realities are always racialized. And certainly on this continent, this entire continent, colonial settler realities are a result of the conquest of the so-called era of discovery, right? So, as such, colonial settler realities here, U.S. or Canada or Mexico, are pervasively a Euro-white supremacist project. And so whiteness, too, whiteness, which is the problem that lies at the heart, the heart of my critique of reconciliation in the U.S., is deeply relevant in this context in Canada. Um, I'm fairly confident that whiteness in Canada looks somewhat, but not entirely different than U.S. American whiteness. And while I'm something of an expert in the latter, I am by no means an expert in the former, but I've had 24 hours, so. <laughs> so to say that is to say it's going to be incumbent on all of you who are insiders to this context to help me as an outsider here understand what the relevances do and do not look like. So what I'm trying to say, I think, is, and I mentioned this last night, I'm not here trying to pretend I'm an expert in the Canadian context. I took that on for like three minutes, thought, oh, and then I was like, that's not, that's not my job, right? I'm here for 48 hours. Um, I did do a little prep and reading, though, so I'm not, I wasn't totally irresponsible, but that's not my work. My work and my hope is that throughout our entire time together, we can pivot back and forth between what I know most deeply and what you all know most deeply. Right? So that we'll engage one another in a kind of encounter between our respective particularities. Um, in my, in my um, theological training, womanist theologians and ethicists taught me and taught me deeply that particularity must be where we all begin. We root ourselves firmly there and that only if we do that can we come to some sort of what they might call provisionally universal in truths or insights. Okay. <clears throat> 
So I'm hoping really we will encounter each other through our particularities and that we will do so in a way that enables us to have a powerful but nuanced cross-border dialogue about resonances and differences that might allow us as we engage them to identify some of our shared moral obligations as Christians who are part of a tradition that is utterly bound up in colonial settler racist violence. So that's the work of this morning. <clears throat> so here's where, where I'm going to begin. I'm going to start in fall of 2014 in the United States. Fall of 2014, a young man, a very young man by the name of Michael Brown was killed by police, a police officer in Ferguson, Missouri. And the next morning after his murder, it was a murder despite what the state said, the next morning newspapers across the U.S. were full of images that were eerily similar to those that filled newspapers at the height of the civil rights movement. The only difference was they were in color and those other images were in black and white. But there were fires blazing across the city of Ferguson. And there were military tanks that were brought in. And there were pictures of protesters holding up their hands and standing toe to toe, face to face, with police in full riot gear, with masks, clubs, and guns. And there were pictures of young children crying because their eyes were burning from the plumes of tear gas that were shot at them night after night as a militarized police force let loose on truly nonviolent protesters. Churches were stockpiling milk of magnesia because apparently milk of magnesia, that calcium, the, it's soothing to tear gas burns. That's what churches were doing for ministry in Ferguson. So Ferguson quickly became a household word in U.S. national discourse. But the thing is, on its heels, other words quickly became familiar in our context. Cleveland became familiar, where 12-year-old Tamir Rice was murdered by police as he sat in a park playing with a plastic water gun. I have a nephew who's black who's 12, and every time I see him, I think about Tamir Rice. He's a child. Baltimore, where Freddie Gray was brutalized by police so badly, his spine was broken and he died in a coma in a matter of hours. Charleston, two summers ago, where nine black Christians were massacred during a Bible study. Minneapolis, where Philando Castile was shot and killed while his girlfriend and baby sat in the car after he was pulled over for a broken taillight. I could go on and on and on. The litany, we could spend an hour or more in the litany of names and places. Two days ago, Antoine Rose in Philadelphia, killed by police, a beautiful young man. So since fall of 2014, I have found myself as a, a, a professor, as, a, as an activist, as a person who's part of the church, surrounded, I have felt, by white U.S. Americans who have seemed utterly stunned. So for my white brothers and sisters, including many white U.S. American Christians, the stunned has seemed like this, like surprised. Like it's had a coating of disbelief to it, as in what? We're still this racially alienated? We still live in worlds this different from one another? What do we do with this? Now what? And that was before the 2016 election. Since that election, those same people have sounded more like this. These are people I love, so this is not me calling people out. This, these are people, my beloveds, right? People saying, oh my God. How did this happen? Who did this? I've also been surrounded by brothers and sisters of color since fall of 2014, who have also seemed stunned. But their stunned has been qualitatively different. It has not been the stunned of surprised. It's been the stunned of outrage and a fierce despair. And it's gone more like this. Enough. Basta. And since the 2016 election, it's gone like this. What do you mean, who did this? Have you read the demographics of the vote? We have been telling you this for decades. Decades. 
So I don't know if you know this, um, but if you break down the U.S. vote in the 2016 election that elected DT, whose name shall not be spoken from me today, every category of the vote, in every category, white U.S. Americans voted for him in a ma majority. Okay? Yes, he lost the popular vote, but if you break down the racial demographics, you, you, how, no, however you parse it, a majority of white U.S. Americans voted for this man. White women, 53%. White evangelical Christians, 81%. Mainline white Protestants, the folks I spend a ton of time with in my own identity and, and life, 58%. White Catholics, 60%. What do you mean who did this? How are you asking that question? So this is the context I want to frame. Um, I want to frame a little bit then the way that we have been engaging race in the U.S. Church for a very long time now. For a very long time, probably in the last four decades, hands down, the most frequent, predictable commentary on race you will hear from a U.S. pulpit is a statement that goes like this. I have probably preached this statement. That's a full confession. I'm sure at some point I preached this statement. 11 o'clock on Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour of the week. So this was a claim that was made by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in the early 1960s. And statistically in the U.S., it's quite true. 11, Sunday morning, I mean, Christians in the U.S., one of the most diverse nations on the planet, we worship in spaces as racially separate and distinct today as we did before the civil rights movement. Not since, just since, the, like before. And so when, when we in the church invoke this statement from U.S. pulpits, we invoke it as a lament. It's the way we understand our racial problem. And separate worship seems to us to be a sign of sin. It seems to be a sign of brokenness. It must mean, we think, that there's resistance to difference. We think that racial separation is evidence of mistrust, non-acceptance. And then sometimes we go like this, otherwise they would be here with us. That's usually what we do, if we're honest. So for decades, decades now, white U.S. American Christians have responded to this lament. We have responded to this problem pretty logically, I think. By making work for interracial togetherness, relationships, we've made that the primary way we talk about race in the church, in the U.S. And so we do things like we invoke images of the Christian community as being one in Christ. We lift up metaphors of family. We're just one family after all. And we emphasize the diverse beauty of God's creation. We're all beautifully created in God's image. That's how we talk about it. And the theological concept we use here is reconciliation. Now, I like to call it a reconciliation paradigm, and it's not, that's not um, insignificant. I like to say it's a reconciliation paradigm, which is distinct from re reconciliation itself, because a paradigm is like glasses. I went my whole life, I'm 47, I just turned 47. My entire life, until three years ago, I went without having to wear glasses. Anybody of you familiar with that? No, you're too young. And when I got my glasses, my readers, these are actually progressives, I declined quickly, I discovered that the shape and the size of the frame determined what I could see on the page. I'd be standing up to speak, and I'd be like, whoa, I can't even see outside this frame, right? The frame determines what you see. And it actually, by doing so, it doesn't only determine the answers you can come to, it predetermines the questions you think are important. It sets the entire conversation in a particular way, which also frames the way you identify what the priorities are, what you need to spend your time and energy on. Okay, so we've been using a reconciliation paradigm in the church in the U.S. for decades. And I now want to be very, very, very clear, and I say this to the communities I'm involved with in the U.S. too. I'm not here to disavow any of the values I named. 
not reconciliation, not the diverse beauty of God's creation, not the image of a united, loving human family. I long for a racially reconciled church so badly that some days my bones ache. And I'm certainly not here to disavow reconciliation as an outsider to the colonial settler and First Nations dialogues happening in Canada. That is not my intention here. Reconciliation may, it may, resonate differently here in ways that are part of that we're going to need to pivot back and forth together, right? At the same time, I suspect there's some similarities that would be worthy of us wrestling with. I felt like I heard some of them last night. So I am here to say since I'm not here to disavow all of those things, I am here to say that in the U.S., the reconciliation as a paradigm has utterly failed. Utterly failed. I'm done with it. Communities of color are done with it, more importantly. It's particularly failed communities of color and native communities, and it has failed them for reasons we can actually identify that are not difficult to figure out. So there's a whole bunch of problems with the reconciliation paradigm. And here's one of them in the U.S. context. Reconciliation rests on this basic assumption that all of our differences need to be celebrated and embraced. God's diverse beauty creation, right? We just need to celebrate and embrace those differences more deeply, unlearn the stereotypes, be welcoming of the stranger. And so the logic goes like this if we really boil it down. I need to come to better love your blackness or your Africanness or your nativeness or your Latinoness or your Chicananess. I need, I, Jen Harvey, need to come to better love and celebrate and understand those things. And you need to better come to love and celebrate my whiteness. That's the logic of a reconciliation paradigm. Right? It's morally incoherent in that way. It's morally incoherent from the beginning, if that's the basic framework. Even when we add white privilege to the discussion, which we often do now in the United States, and we should, and even when we emphasize that true reconciliation has to be just, as in justice reconciliation, which we must insist that, at its core, at least it's the way it's articulated in the U.S. church, at its core, Reconciliation centers this idea that there's some sort of moral and spiritual and cultural and historical parallel in our diverse identities, right? So even if we've done a little bit wrong in this identity, we can fix that and there's still a parallel that allows us to build relationships and be friends. And it's just not the case. It's not the case. Colonial settler white identity is not the same thing as indigenous, indigenous identity. It's not the same thing. So, for mainline Protestant U.S. denominations have explicitly committed ourselves to a reconciliation paradigm for decades. We have produced volumes of Christian education material in which we call for sacred dialogue across lines of race, and we framed the racial justice question as queries into how can we achieve welcoming, inclusive churches, which, of course, I'm not opposed to that. I think we should have welcoming, inclusive churches, but I don't think it's the work. And when we say this, what we're talking about is a church that is char together, characterized by togetherness across lines of difference. Meaningfully. That's what we mean by it. So this type of reconciliation in the U.S. context has very significant and deeply legitimate theological and historical precedents. Precedents I deeply honor. Um, it comes for us directly out of the courageous and oh-so-brilliant civil rights movement. That's where reconciliation paradigms come from in the U.S., and specifically from the work of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And King, I mean, King articulated a vision of beloved community for the church and for the U.S., and really for the entire human community, and his vision of beloved community meant this. For him, this vision was a truly integrated community, a place of interracial togetherness across lines of difference, okay? Where people authentically care for and are with one another. For him and other civil rights um, Christians, it was a vision of life together that went beyond 
just desegregating. It wasn't only about bringing down those oppressive um, segregation laws. Um, and it claimed that love, and for King, it was divine love. Divine love is our primary human condition. That's our original state. Okay, King was a liberal theologian. He didn't, the original sin stuff was, le we are originally intended, our existential state is a state of love, divine love. And so we are called to create and return to that prior condition because our hostility to difference reflects an alienated state, not just from one another, but from the divine. Okay? So we're called to that work. And early civil rights work on desegregation and voting rights, two of the most significant achievements in the U.S., was part of that work of realizing beloved community for King and other activists. Because in King's theology, the public and the legal form of love has to be securing justice. Okay, you don't run around saying, I love you so much, you fight for justice. That's how you show love. Okay, I'm on board with that entire project. I don't think that falls prey to the reconciliation paradigm whatsoever. But what happened is that white Christians who were active in civil rights or who watched the movement's courage and vision of, as children became captivi captivated by this vision. And liberal and progressive white Christians, over time, whole denominations bought in. Hearts transformed leaders today in the churches in the U.S. who were active then in the civil rights movement and beloved community, but in a very stripped down form, has gripped the liberal white Protestant U.S. mind ever since, ever since the 60s. And despite then these sacred and historical and theological precedents, the problem here is that the reconciliation paradigm, as it came to be embraced by the white mainline Protestant church, it rests on a thoroughly whitewashed and colonial settler civil rights story. Because what happened is actually this. By the mid-1960s, long before the civil rights movement was over, right? We always say it, was, it went through the early 70s. Maybe, you, maybe it ended when King was assassinated in 68. But by the mid-1960s, black power movements in the U.S. had already begun expressing disappointments with civil rights. 64, 1964, riots and fires had consumed Rochester, New York, triggered there, incidentally, by police violence against black people, right, cul-de-sac. And organizers there said, our problem isn't the right to vote. We don't need integration. We've got that. Our problem is access to jobs. And by the late 60s and early 70s, city after city across the United States erupted into flames. Detroit, Los Angeles, tear gas, tanks, almost always triggered, like the match, by police violence. By that time, black power had thoroughly critiqued civil rights analysis of the actual situation in the U.S., as well as civil rights solutions for it. Now, black power activists were not hostile to the idea that everyone should have legal rights. Of course not. They did believe everyone should have legal equality, but they were very clear that equal rights was not going to address. It was not the, the, the they were no panacea for the diverse and complex and specific ways that oppression and subjugation impacted black people, which had deep historical roots. And black power was particularly critical of beloved community because in black power's analysis, the primary problem wasn't segregation or even separation, right? Echoes of that 11 o'clock lament we are still using in the U.S. white church, for which the fix then becomes reconciliation. That's not the problem, they said. The problem is power and systemic white exploitation. And by the mid-60s, black power had shown up in Christian contexts. And so I want to give you just three little moments where it shows up in the white church story. The first is this. Um, there was an organization called the Episcopal Society for Cultural and Racial Unity. ESCRU is the acronym. And ESCRU was one of the most important civil rights groups in the church. ESCRU accomplished many valuable things. But one of ESCRU's goals became to end all, uh, all single-race parishes in the Episcopal Church. 
Now, this makes sense. If you have basically said over and over, the most significant problem with single-race parishes is that they are evidence of separation. We need to come together. We need to build relationships. Then work to realize beloved community or reconciliation becomes your goal because that's what you're seeing. Esker's reconciliation vision literally couldn't see the difference between a black-led, all-black church and a white-led, all-white church in the 60s in the United States. Those are not the same thing. They're not the same thing in 2018 either. And so you know what they did? Esker, civil rights group, most important civil rights group in the church perhaps, supported the Episcopal denomination in the 60s as it closed down financially struggling black parishes over and over again. This was utterly consistent with reconciliation paradigm because it put people together instead of resource redistribution to those financially struggling parishes. So by the mid-60s, black priests who had been very active in escrow and who were ardent supporters of integration, they saw what was happening, saw it was eroding their power, and they left. They were out by 1968, and they formed a union of black clergy and laity. My second example comes from the National Council of Churches, uh, our Commission on Race and Religion, and this group in the U.S. had been very effective in its first couple of years. Black and white Christians had been active in it together. But historian James Finley says that by 65, 1965, very early, um, the commission had lost steam. I'm not sure how you lose steam in 1965. There's a lot left to be done, right? But they did. And what Finley says is that by 64, 65, U.S. white lady quit showing up. Voting rights were one thing. We passed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which secured voting rights. White Christians have been very active for that. Once the talk turned to jobs and resources and redistribution, we were out. The other thing that happened was a black Christian started publicly expressing frustration at how white-led the commission was and how white people kept making all the decisions about what needed to happen. So Benjamin Payton was the first African-American director of the commission. He stepped into that role in 1965, and when he did so, he began his tenure like this. He said, the rights which have been couched in law, that is civil rights talk, are now being sought in life as practical, social, and economic matters. That's black power talk. And then a year later, he called black members of the commission out to form their own group, and the National Committee of Black Churchmen was born, right? So as black power became more and more compelling among black Christians, alienation between whites and blacks became more and more pronounced because white Christians who were active in civil rights utterly rejected black power, utterly rejected it. So my final... Um, an anecdote from this history is, comes from 1969, the year after um, Dr. King had been assassinated. And on May 4th, 1969, James Foreman, I was just talking at breakfast with a couple of you who were at Riverside Church not that long ago. May 4th, um, at the Riverside Church, which is one of the flagship Protestant denominations in New York, New York, um, James Foreman, who was a powerful civil rights activist, along with a whole cadre of African Americans who were involved in various ways in grassroots empowerment on the part of the black community, uh, walked into worship, interrupted worship. Can you imagine that? And from the pulpit of Riverside Church, which if you've never seen, I can only imagine. I was there for Dr. Cohn's funeral. Or as I was live. I wasn't there. I didn't. Get, I was live streaming it from Dr. Cohn's funeral, and where Reverend Dr. Warnock was speaking from. I kept imagining James Foreman. And he read the Black Manifesto there. And the manifesto began like this. He said, we the black people assembled in Detroit, Michigan, we are fully aware that we've been forced to come together because racist white America has exploited our resources, minds, bodies, and labor. And we are demanding $500 million from the Christian white churches. This is not a large sum of money. We know the churches have tremendous wealth, and its membership, White America, has profited from and still exploits black people. $15 for every black brother and sister in the United States is the beginning of the reparations due us as a people who've been exploited, degraded, brutalized, killed, and persecuted. And it's amazing. If you go and read the, the manifesto, 
the 500 million, there was a very specific list of how it was going to be used. And when I read it today, I'm like, yep, that would change the calculus in the United States. In fact, if we had done any of that, we would not have DT 2016 because power would have shifted in powerful ways. So I probably don't have to tell you that if white U.S. American Christians had um, rejected black power, they positively excoriated the Black Manifesto. It's a devastating, amazing history of the year after that. Um, but what matters to me here is that by the end of the Civil Rights Movement, Findlay, church historian, says that the truth is racial alienation came to rule the day in U.S. churches. The old coalitions between blacks and whites in the churches, he says, um, declined. And by the 70s, after the um, Black Manifesto era, black and white Christians were more alienated than we had been before civil rights. Not just more alienated because of the Black Manifesto, manifesto more alienated, it like said, we went back to 1930s. 40s, okay? Which is opposite of how we tell the story, which is why even when we admit in the U.S. that we have a long way to go, every time we talk about the civil rights story having made things so much better, we are giving a whitewashed version of our own church history. We have literally just ignored that entire part of our actual civil rights history in the church. I didn't learn about the Black Manifesto until I was doing my doctoral work at Union Seminary. I'd been in New York at that point for five years doing my MDiv. Not a word. At Union. We're next door to Riverside. Okay. So here's why this matters to me so much. It's not that the civil rights movement accomplished nothing or that it wasn't courageous and brilliant. It did, and it was. And it's certainly not that black power movements were perfect. They most assuredly were not. But at the end of the day, the critique that black power made passionately and repeatedly more than 50 years ago now was proven deadly accurate by the rebellions in cities and the outrages that the U.S. committed in the late 60s and early 70s. And at the end of the day, I deeply believe this, black power's critique was terrifyingly predictive of everything we've seen unfolding in the United States since fall of 2014. From all of those killings I began with, on through the 2016 election, which, in which white Christians voted for a man who was enabling white Christian nationalism to take hold in the United States, and then on through the fall 2017 KKK neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. And on through the horrors of young children being separated from their parents and put in cages on the U.S. border this week. The truth is, white U.S. Americans should have been surprised by none of this. But we were because we've refused to listen. We've made reconciliation the takeaway point for the civil rights movement, even though the reality is it was unequivocally announced as and demonstrated to be inadequate. We've gone on as if those critiques of our brothers and sisters of color never happened. And we've held on to reconciliation as a paradigm, ignoring, forgetting, and marginalizing, sometimes even repudiating, calls for power, repair, and redress, which should be the center Calls that insisted that in place of a reconciliation paradigm, we move from a reparations paradigm. That it must come first. In all the Christian ed material I read when I was writing Dear White Christians, believe you me, if I die without ever having to read another Christian ed material, I will die a happy woman. Friends, in one flicker of a moment, once, did I see any acknowledgement of Black Power's critique of beloved community. My critique here today is not so much about a critique of beloved community itself. It's a critique of what white Christians have done with beloved community. And I certainly read nothing about native power struggles, which were also happening in the U.S. at this time. And I read nothing about Chicano power movements, which were also happening. And none of those were based on calls for integration or reconciliation either. That's not what those communities were asking for. But beloved community is all over our materials about unity. Okay. So if reconciliation is the takeaway point from a whitewashed civil rights story, reparations is absolutely the takeaway from a more complex, truthful civil rights story in the United States. Because black Christians weren't asking to sit down, build relationships, and reconcile. And they're certainly not asking that for that today. They were demanding that white U.S. Christians repent and repair. And they were calling us to name 
understand and take seriously the material relationships through which we are in connection with each other, right? Material relationships our white identity puts us in relative to communities of color. We come to one another through material relationships, always. And they were demanding that we respond to our structural location in a society that was organized still so violently and so hierarchically that to them, reconciliation talk sounded more like resounding gongs and clanging cymbals which the church has been warned not to fall for. So when I was preparing to come, I was reading a little bit about Canada and race and indigenous communities here, just a little bit. And Lynn shared with me um, a little bit of um, recent news, which were very um, devastating and helpful. And I found in some of the stories I was reading what seemed to me, gently, as the outsider, right? Seemed to me to offer some evidence that there may be communities here that are hearing some resounding gongs and, clung, and clinging cymbals. So I read about Colton Bushi, age 22, from the Red Pheasant First Nation. And I read about what Erica Violet Lee, a Cree activist here said after the verdict was announced that Bushi's killer would not be convicted. And Lee said this, and we could pull this out of the U.S. context too, quote, watching the family go through the trial, we all realize that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Canadian justice system as it's set up can't bring us justice. The pressure's on indigenous people to heal and to move on and to forget the past. But the whole past is tied to this verdict. And then I read a little bit, just a little bit about Tina Fontaine. And I watched the video of the statement that Sue Caribou, a Winnipeg advocate, made after the charges were stayed against the person initially charged in Fontaine's murder. And Caribou said this, not once in my life have I ever seen justice since I was effing young. Not once do our people ever get justice. I have 10 murdered, two missing, and to this effing day, we don't have justice, she said. So in 1973, a native theologian by the name of Vine Deloria Jr. wrote God is Red. And in that work, he said this. Before any final solution to American history can occur, a reconciliation must be effected between the spiritual owner of the land, American Indians, and the political owner of the land, American whites. Guilt and accusations cannot continue to revolve in a vacuum without some effort at reaching a solution. Now, I'm not putting the word reparations in Deloria's mouth, and at least in the U.S. context, the word reparations has to be carefully unpacked relative to Native communities because the U.S. has done a lot of, like, small payouts to, for land claims that they've called reparations. That is not what we're talking about when we talk about repair. Um, I'm not putting reparations as a word in Deloria's mouth. Um, but I hear in that statement a paradigm shift because when he uses, even though he uses the word reconciliation, I want you to notice he distinguishes between spiritual owner and political owner, right, which are not parallel identities. He's not asking that we honor and celebrate the political owner of the land as such. Reconciliation means there's a redress, redress adjustment of those distinct identities. <clears throat> we relate to one another, he said later in the book For This Land. We relate to one another through the land. We reconcile through the land. We don't reconcile through in the air. We reconcile through the land, he said. This is precisely the analysis black Christians were making. Reconciling through the land is a demand that white colonial settlers repent and repair concretely. It's a call that recognizes the distinctiveness in our identity and that they are not moral parallels, which is difficult. It's the same recognition black Christians were making when they demanded that white U.S. Americans take seriously our material relationships, that our identity puts us in relative to men and women of color. 2008... Australia apologized to Aboriginal peoples 
the parliament and the prime minister there. I didn't know, and someone told me last night, it might have been you, Jennifer, that um, about Canada's apology. Was it you? Anyway, someone was sharing that with me. Sorry, it's been a blur. But in Australia in 2008, the apology lamented the egregious and systematic oppression that the Australian government had visited upon a, quote, proud people and proud culture. And I'm sure you know, just like the U.S. and just like Canada, Australia's settler history is constituted by massive dispossession of indigenous people's lands, genocidal assimilationist practices, including the forced removal of Aboriginal children from their families and into abusive boarding schools. And after that apology, I found myself unwittingly, I did not initiate it, in an email exchange with another white colonial settler U.S. American scholar and with George Tink Tinker, who's of the Osage Nation and is a native theologian in, in the States. And many um, were applauding the Australian government, most especially settler colonial allies. <laughs> they were applauding the Australian government for their apology, and my white colleague had, had emailed Tink and I actually to say, look, isn't this great? And Tinker quickly wrote back to us and said, said, no, it's not great. Indigenous people, he said, should reject any apology that comes without land transfers. And he said, in fact, that an apology itself was worse than no apology because what it did was posed as a moral recalibration without actually changing the material conditions of Aboriginal people's lives. He didn't, so he wanted the Indigenous people to have nothing to do with it. So this is the pivot point for me, the point where I'm clear that the story I'm telling is not just a black-white story and not just a U.S. American story. The call to a reparations paradigm extends to any and all white colonial settler relationships with communities of color and indigenous communities in any context where they are found because of the 1400s and 1500s. And a reparations paradigm in that way, also in ways that I find and that we need right now, I need right now, can also allow us, even as it brings in indigenous colonial settler relationships, it also allows us to envision deep intersectional work for justice that is called for from all of us right now. So I want to say a little bit about that before we come to the 10 o'clock hour. So historically in the U.S., just as black power movements were shifting the conversation from integration to power and justice, so did power movements among Native peoples and Latinos and Asians and Asian Americans articulate a reparations paradigm in the 60s and 70s, going forward still. And these power movements particularly understood and especially talked about the ways that colonialism, which makes us shift from civil rights talk, even in the U.S., right, where we love to talk about civil rights, to human rights talk, where we, we don't really like to talk about human rights in the U.S. anymore. But it makes a shift, right, when we start talking about colonialism, to human rights. And these power movements were clear that truly analyzing the experiences of marginalized communities required, even within U.S. borders, required this colonial analysis. And black power movements, too, started to articulate this understanding, even among African Americans in the U.S., that colonialism was also the way to understand their experience, right? Um, African Americans didn't just arrive to the place we now call the United States. So, for example, Chicano power movements in the 1970s were talking about and linking the situation of Mexican people, Chicano people, in the United States to the 1848 land grab that the U.S., did in the e illegal war we launched in order to abscond with Mexico's most of their resources, most of their resource rich land. So Chicanos were talking about that in response to which they weren't saying, hey, could we reconcile and sit down and talk? They were demanding redress of a legacy of colonial settler occupation, as in we didn't cross the border. The border crossed us. That's a reparations paradigm rooted in an understanding of colonialism. So when the U.S. church wants to take on, in a prophetic way, a stand against the current DT administration on immigration, which it's trying to, we cannot do it well, truthfully, or in a way that will change the moral needle if we do it by talking about welcoming the stranger. No. We owe a moral debt 
And it's been our attempts to just skim the surface that have left us vulnerable to things becoming the way they are now. We owe something, and we have to root our feet there and tell the truth. We have to tell the truth. Borders are material evidence of histories of violence and dispossession. That's what they are. So here's another example. Uh, again, this little nation to your south is busy trying right now to erase the fact of climate change. Doing all we can, not, I mean, yes, we, I'm there. Everything in our formal power to implode collaborative global work to address the climate crisis. And it is very clear to me that as we try and fight them on this from the inside, but we need folks on the outside to do it too, that we have got to center, we've got to make central, a deep understanding and a public acknowledgement of indigenous nations' relationships to place. We've got to work, root our work in environmental justice in a reparative reckoning that supports the contemporary land rights struggles that so many indigenous peoples are still waging here and in the U.S. and in other places too. As in, the land that was degraded causing this environmental crisis wasn't ours to begin with. And as in, as native peoples have told us in so many different iterations, the historical and theological connection between the way that white Euro settlers saw and treated the land, having thus caused the environmental crisis, are the same ways that we saw and see and treated and treat native peoples and their bodies as commodities for plunder, right? So here's the connection. When we see the U.S. administration ignore Puerto Rico, right, after Hurricane Maria, 4,200 people at least dead in Puerto Rico because of the hurricane. Our administration said it was about 60. What we're seeing there is the intersection of colonial settler histories and the environmental crisis in extreme, showing up in extreme weather. And now the people of Puerto Rico are left to die. When we talk about climate change, we better be talking about reparative climate change. That's what we've got to do. We have a city in Michigan, Flint, Michigan, made up of mostly poor black and brown people. They have lead in their water that's so high it's causing a public health crisis. And that crisis in Flint has everything to do with what the Standing Rock Sioux were doing, trying to stop that pipeline coming through their land, not only in violation of treaties, but also putting their water at, at risk for being poisoned. It's all connected. Sovereignty and land rights struggles, it's all interrelated. And I believe that our ability to envision and then work to create a just and a liberative future depends on us getting those interrelationships right in the ways that we resist and we seek to transform. And the only way we can do it, my friends, is to begin to get much more deeply clear about where the whiteness and the settler stuff shows up. Because when we don't, the coalitions that we need to intersect connect and together fight, they don't, they don't stay. I really do want friendships, but you know what I want more than that? I want powerful coalitions that can win. I want that even more than I want to be friends. I bet if we win, we'll end up friends. So I'm very aware that this can sound very overwhelming. I don't um, travel around talking about things that are easy. I'm very aware of the enormity of what I've just laid out. And I'm aware that it risks invoking despair. But I'm going to say this. We claim to be a resurrection people. That's what we say. We claim to be people for whom death is never the last word. And on that front, the message here then is multi-layered. First, it's this. The fact that it's overwhelming because it's all interrelated, that's good news in the sense it means we can start anywhere. There's no place we can't begin. No little place is too small, no big place. Anywhere we start, we're going to find it intersecting. We just have to see it correctly. Second thing is this. If we can get this right, if we can come together, work across racial and colonial settler lines, through a reparations paradigm, for justice, a kind of coming together that, at least in the U.S., reconciliation's never really made possible. It's always been surface at best. If we could actually do that, we are powerful. We are powerful. 
the folks being marginalized and disfranchised right now in the United States, we are the majority. There's like 10, 15, 20 different groups of types of people. All we got to do is get together and he'll be gone. Third, for me, so many others, this is a very powerful, powerful ancestral claiming. So many others have come before us in this work. It's been tempting in the U.S. to think that all of a sudden everything changed in 2016. From Obama to Trump, are you kidding me? Oh, I said his name, sorry. Voldemort. <laughs> From Obama to that, how did that happen? And in some ways, everything did change. But if we're really truthful, in some ways, exactly nothing changed, which is why we are where we are. The verdict today is all about the past. The activists here said, when black and native and Chicana power movements challenged white Christians to engage in meaningful activities of repair in response to the very identifiable injustices that structure all of our lives, friends, they did it, many of them youth, while facing down the same violence of racism and hatred that brought us to the contemporary moment, and they planted their feet, and they locked arms, and they stood up amidst a reign of racial colonial terror with courage and conviction and a commitment that kept saying over and over again, we will be free. We will be free. It's our duty to fight for our freedom. It's our duty to win. So dear church, now what? In contrast to the confusion that a reconciliation paradigm has often created, a reparations paradigm is incredibly clarifying. It helps us better understand our actual relationships to one another and our actual material relationships to one another. In contrast to the ambiguity of the work that reconciliation so often creates, a reparations paradigm helps us identify more clearly the necessary pathways we must create. They don't just exist. This isn't going to be easy, but we can start to see what we have to create. Pathways far more productive, far more truthful, and far more life-giving than reconciliation has ever allowed to open up to this point. In contrast to reconciliation as a paradigm, a reparations paradigm is unquestionably morally coherent. We don't have to pretend whiteness is a parallel to nativeness or blackness. We can just let that go. What a relief. And I would be remiss if I did not close in this way. A reparations paradigm is deeply biblical. It's deeply biblical. Do you remember Zacchaeus? We should not fear and despair reparations talk. We know as resurrection people, we know from the biblical witness that when we confess the reality of sin, repentance and repair offer us new life. And so I want to invite and challenge you to remember Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus started out afraid. He started out broken. He'd worked with and profited from empire. He'd served at the beck and the call of imperial power. And he was so broken, he thought he wanted to see Jesus, but he, had to, he climbed up in a tree because he didn't really want to go face to face. And then he heard the call. And what did he do? When he came down, before he did anything else, he gave half his possessions to the poor, the wealth he had earned through complicity and empire, and he gave back fourfold from whom he had taken. And then where did Zacchaeus go? Let's see if Canadians know their Bible the way this Baptist does. <laughs> where did he go? Where did he go home to? He went home with Jesus. Zacchaeus got to go home with Jesus. Zacchaeus was liberated when he engaged in reparations. He ended up whole and sitting at the fellowship table with Jesus. And so dear white colonial settler Christians like me, we got to take those WWJD bracelets off. Do you guys have that here? American, U.S. American Christians love to wear WWJD bracelets, right? WWZD. That's your new bracelet. That's who we are in this story. We don't get liberated by being like Jesus in this story. We get liberated because we recognize we're Zacchaeus. Reparations is modeled in the biblical witness as the work that is required of the oppressor. This is a very different vision than the one we've been using in the U.S. church. 
And it's one that might, over long haul work, enable actual interracial togetherness and beloved community. But only if and after white colonial settler Christians join alongside of and in response to black, native, Latina communities in the work of justice by taking up the specific work that is ours to do. It's not the same work that is required. That's how we work together. We find our different work and do it. Rep repentance and repair is not easy. It's not immediately obvious what the next step is. We'll talk about that Friday morning. It's uncertain. It's difficult. But it's sacred. And this is the moment, church. If there was not a moment before, this is the moment for us to remember and learn a new story that is also very old so that we can begin to write a new vision on the wall that's also a very old vision for all the world to see. And if it comes out of Canada, I really am going to migrate. <laughs> and for the white colonial settlers among us like myself, that vision is a vision of repentance and repair. So dear church, 